Getabook.today presents the Praetorian Imperative. Book 6 in the Starship Expeditionary Fleet Series by Shane Lachlan Black. Copyright 2019. It had long been said that human beings had reached a level of such comfort, the only thing that could snap them out of their unconcerned haze would be an enemy soldier yanking the remote out of their hand and shooting their television. For career military officers like Admiral Benjamin Powers, this state of affairs was even more urgent. Politicians and professional meeting attenders were not only highly motivated to perpetuate comfort bubbles for their constituents, they were also likely to be heavily engaged in the business of dishonoring the men and women tasked with preserving civilian lives. One simply couldn't have truth-tellers wearing impressive uniforms and standing in front of television cameras. Those were situations that called for delicate, or indelicate as the case may be, discretion, or outright lying, which was apparently a far easier option for the average guest of honor at a press conference. At the moment, the biggest challenge to getting through the day for the admiral and key members of his staff was going to be getting into the building. The core council hall was quite literally surrounded by protesters, press, crowds of onlookers, civilian police, aliens from a dozen worlds or more, hovering look-down cameras, and at least several hundred automatic barricade robots deployed to politely keep 100 tons of body weight from smashing through the front doors and streaming into the corridors of power. It had been at least a week since Core Alliance President William Baines had uttered the word recusal in a live address. It was a political slip-up, to be sure. But it wasn't the hair-on-fire cataclysm the media had inflated around it. Skywatch Command and the agencies in charge of civilian military oversight had done everything in their power to keep Shay Baines out of the news. But the rumors of her abduction and the wildly inaccurate accounts of what had come to be known as the failed attempt to rescue her seeped into the public consciousness in ways that were almost as insidious as enemy spies. No official word had been offered regarding the events that either had or had not taken place on Mycenae Seti IV. The only Skywatch officers authorized to even know about Commander and Nora Doverly's mission were unwilling to answer questions, even those posed by administration chiefs with the power to declassify just about anything. The truth was, no usable transmissions had been received from the MSETI system. Officially, Doverly and Moody were listed as overdue. Unofficially and for all practical intents and purposes, they were missing in action behind enemy lines. Jason Hunter had been ordered to account for himself, his ship, and his actions in the Rho Theta and Atlantis systems by a civilian committee headed by one of President Baines's most bitter political enemies. Within minutes, the captain had been given a direct order by Admiral Powers himself to remain silent. That standoff led directly to the hearing that was about to take place on the floor of the Corps Council. The Judge Advocate General himself had threatened to intervene, but Powers had talked him down. Admiral Bartholomew James had threatened to discredit Powers publicly, but he had been driven back by Commander Skywatch's Chief of Staff, who implied in a press conference the highest ranking military officer in the Corps Alliance was considering official action to as the press office put it, moderate any professional disagreements in a manner consistent with the highest traditions of Skywatch. Nobody knew for sure what the hell that meant, but it was pretty clear to the Admiralty that any further posturing, especially in public, was unlikely to be tolerated. If there was one thing a man described as the highest-ranking military officer in the Corps Alliance could do, it was threaten subordinates with unimaginable wrath while sounding like he was reading the menu in a cozy Italian lunch spot.
The morning air along the banks of the pond was something that had to be experienced to be believed. It made men think of simpler times, and how thrilling it would be to make trips back and forth to town for things like feed and oil for the lamp. For some, that was paradise considered to more urgent concerns like enemies with reality-altering weapons and the safety of space fleets and their crews. Leaves crunched underfoot. The sky was blue enough to make a romantic's heart break. Only a few clouds were visible along the horizon. It was going to be a beautiful day, and tomorrow was likely to be even better. It was more than a little frightening how quickly one imagined they could acclimate to such an idyllic place. It was disconcerting how rapidly one might become unconcerned with war and strife billions of miles away, despite the call of duty and the certitude of courage. Sitting along the banks of the river were three young boys. By the looks of them, they were almost as bored as the ducks a few yards from shore. One plunked small rocks into the water in a meager attempt to annoy the web-footed fowl, while the others sat with their chins resting in their hands. Next to them was an instantly recognizable model aircraft. It was a wooden replica of an early 20th century fighter. It was even decorated with the Prussian Iron Cross. Not going to be much of a fishing trip with no poles or bait. The boys all looked up as if startled out of plans to knock over a grocery store. Fishing is boring, one of them said making a point of letting his chin fall right back into his hands. Did you paint that plane yourself? I made it from a kit, the fair-haired boy said. It came with stickers for all the parts, but it won't fly right. Stupid kit makers said it would, but it's broken and the radio doesn't even work. The expressions on their faces didn't change. Jason Hunter knelt by the model and picked it up. Its wingspan was roughly two feet. It felt light enough for its size. He turned the model over. The fixed landing gear were solidly attached. The wheels even turned. By now all the boys were watching, curious to see if the man knew why their plane couldn't get off the ground. One thing Jason noticed that was strange was the fact the underside of the plane's wings seemed to be sanded off to a flat finish. He looked more closely and saw the seams in the material at the wing's edges. The model was constructed out of a sturdy but light composite with a texture similar to balsa wood but smoother and coated with a sealant under the colorful paint. She's a D-type albatross, Jason said as he spun the propeller. The boys looked at him as if he had just announced he was a giraffe. Beautiful aircraft, formidable in her time. How do you know what kind of plane it is? Ancient fighter aircraft are a hobby of mine. I used to have a model of this ship's twin in my dorm at the academy. This is one of the planes flown by the Red Baron. By now, Hunter had the undivided attention of the little model plane's ground crew. Red Baron? You've never heard the story? Hunter asked. All three shook their heads. Manfred von Richthofen, one of the deadliest men ever to take flight. He shot down more than 80 enemy pilots. He flew the Fokker DR-1 triplane and this one too. He was a German pilot long ago in a conflict called World War I. The boys all had astonished expressions. It was as if they had never heard the story of a war before or of a man who had fought in one. It made sense. Epsilon Gamma was several light years from any system any civilized star-faring civilization would consider worth fighting over. The term backwater was likely to appear in any description of the two habitable planets orbiting the unremarkable yellow star at its center. Any army that won Epsilon Gamma was as likely to give it back as anything else. Did you know him? One of the boys asked. I've read about him. Hunter replied. He lived a long time before I was born, but everyone still knows his name. His was the legend of the Red Baron. His Fokker triplane was painted all red with black crosses on the wings and tail. If you were a British or a French pilot and you saw that unmistakable red flash in the sky, you knew you were in for the fight of a lifetime. By now their mouths were hanging open. One might have credibly thought they were hypnotized. Does the engine run? Jason asked. The fair-haired boy nodded. Well, then let's see what seems to be the problem. Jason stood, holding the model. Where's a good wide flat surface we can use for a runway? The rocks and ducks were forgotten. The three boys were now totally focused on reclaiming air superiority over the pond. They ran to the nearby road, which was the site of their last failed attempt to get airborne. The fair-haired boy retrieved the radio control unit for the plane. Jason quickly determined both units were battery-powered. As with most toys, the electronics were dramatically limited. He knelt by the side of the road and broke out his universal. In moments, the circuit boards of both controller and plane had been exposed. 
See this? Jason indicated an orange connection controller on the radio. This is a signal dampener. It keeps your controller from fouling up the village communications net. But since we're two miles from town, and since you're going to promise me you won't fly this aircraft any closer to town, we're going to disable it for now. That will give you an extra couple hundred yards of range and save you some battery power while we're at it. The boys crowded around as if they were watching tiny dinosaurs battle in a model arena. This is the digital signal processor, and this is the power supply. Everything looks like it's connected properly. Just one problem to fix. See this? Jason indicated the underside of the plane's wings. This is packing material. He snapped the two foam pieces loose, revealing a curved surface that was no longer hidden by the foam. For an aircraft to fly, it needs lift. That means the air passing over the wing has to move faster than the air passing under it. That pulls the plane up into the sky. If there's something under the wing, that creates drag, and the plane doesn't get any lift. That's why it wouldn't fly before. Jason held the aircraft level. See the shape? How the upper surface of the wing is curved and the lower surface is flatter? By the looks on their faces, one could have credibly concluded Jason Hunter had just awarded them one of the keys to the universe. The captain could see the gears turning in three young heads. He knew they wouldn't be able to wait long to see their plane in action, so he reassembled the circuit board covers for both units, made sure they had power, and set the albatross down on the dusty road. It looked rather frail just sitting there by itself, but the captain knew it wouldn't be still for long. He handed the radio to the fair-haired boy. The other two looked like they were about to take flight themselves. Their gazes snapped back and forth from plane to radio as they performed their final flight checks. The fair-haired boy looked up at Jason, his expression somewhere between asking permission and gratitude. Jason nodded. Contact! He barked. The boy smiled. The radio controller lit up as the tiny throttle spun the plane's propeller up to speed. It started rolling down the road with the other two boys running along either side. For a moment, it appeared the little model was going to rattle itself to pieces, bumping and banging into rocks, pieces of wood and other debris. Finally, it hopped a good six feet before bouncing off the road and taking flight. The two boys chasing it stopped and threw their hands up, cheering as the albatross D-type soared into the sky. Even the joy at Kitty Hawk would have paled in comparison. Let's have a slow circle of the battlefield, pilot, Jason said, mostly for show. He folded his arms in his best officer inspection pose. The fair-haired boy guided the controls and his plane rolled left. It began a leisurely course arc back towards its makeshift runway with its tiny engine buzzing and wheezing. Jason and the boy turned to watch as it flew overhead and banked left again, flying out over the nearby riverbank and two cows who couldn't have cared less. Hunter put his hand up over his eyes to keep sight of the craft as it flew past its first course again. You are cleared to land. The boy expertly guided the tiny plane down towards the same road, this time in the opposite direction. The other boys ran as it flew by and finally touched down. In a few yards it rolled to a stop. The fair-haired boy ran ahead. Jason chose to stroll. The energy level in the amateur flight crew was a rather stark contrast to their demeanor fifteen minutes earlier. In the distance, Jason could see a woman making her way through the tall grass. Further in the distance was a homestead of some kind. A fence separated a yard from the rest of the trees around the pond. The faint outline of eaves and a house were visible beyond the leaves and branches. Nick! Nick! Come in for breakfast now! The tone in her voice was unmistakably a mom's. Her apron and dish towel completed the image. She didn't linger for an answer. The message had been delivered and the morning's aerial adventures would have to be postponed. Nick, who Jason surmised was the fair-haired leader of the Epsilon Gamma Historical Aircraft Society, ran up to the captain and held a hand over his eyes to shield them from the morning glare. Come to breakfast at my house. You have to meet my uncle and tell him about the Red Heron. Jason had to admit he was more than a little hungry, and it had been a considerable interval since he had been served a home-cooked breakfast on a planet's surface. That sounds great. He guided the boy by the shoulder and walked along with his new adopted students towards the fence and gate. The captain had to admit, he also couldn't wait to hear the story of the Red Heron. He also had to admit he was of two minds on this particular morning. One was headed to breakfast, the other was a great distance away, in a torn and bleeding star system called Bayoni, where his fellow officers and crewmates had fought for the lives of thousands of civilians 
and to preserve their ability to protect the core alliance from a man whose motives were still as obscure and dangerous as ever. The captain of the starship Argent and the flag of a powerful military force called Strike Fleet Perseus had performed a daring vanishing act. As a student of war, Jason Hunter was well aware all military strategies ultimately depended on deception in some form. In this particular case, they also depended on misdirection. He had always known this particular gambit would require him to be patient and leave the details to the highly trained officers he had so often relied on for life and limb. That didn't make it any easier. He had to avoid the battlefield as urgently as he wanted to reclaim it. The future success of the starship Argent depended on Captain Hunter executing a plan that was sure to have traumatized half his crew and endangered the other half. It was a gamble. The kind of thing Hunter specialized in. It was what he had built an entire career out of. Battleship captains were rarely risk-takers, and they most certainly weren't brash hair-on-fire warriors with larger-than-life images and the obligations they demanded. Capital ships were simply too expensive and too valuable to use as spear points. An officer assigned to command a ship like Argent was traditionally a heavily armed mayor as opposed to an army's high champion. Line captains didn't roar into the breach, and they certainly didn't lead from the front. Hunter broke all those rules, and then some. The admirals who had put him in the center chair aboard the fleet's newest strike battleship were well aware of his propensity for what some rivals referred to as expletive heroics. They wanted that brand of fighting to go with the brand of hardware Argent brought to the party. The prudent faction at Skywatch Command had risked everything to overcome anti-alarmist obstructionism. There was no sense in being meek about betting heavily on the outcome. Jason Hunter was that bet. He was also the only captain who would even dream of what he was attempting. At the same time, he was the only captain likely to pull it off. If he succeeded, he would have a gargantuan tactical advantage at the time of his choosing. If he failed, irradiated planets and billions of casualties would become an eternal monument to a man who was too clever by half. But this gambit wasn't a simple act of misdirection. Hunter was also gambling on the personalities of his fellow pilots. The Bandit Jacks were an example of the rare moment when five superstars joined forces and somehow managed to synthesize their egos and hunger for the spotlight. Some compared them to great sports teams of the past. In football, for example, they often used the example of a future Hall of Fame quarterback teaming up with a future Hall of Fame receiver. Neither player could achieve his goal without the other, so they were forced, in a manner of speaking, to cooperate, bury their attitudes, and become part of something bigger than either one of them. That was what many surmised had happened to the Jacks. Hunter rocketed through his promotions. He was one of only about 4% of the members of each academy class that graduated to a commission as a junior grade lieutenant instead of an ensign. In Hunter's case, his graduation included an invitation to flight school, largely because of his aptitude for the math and his reputation as a leader among his classmates. The promotion was his scholarship, and he proved in rapid fashion it was well deserved. In less than a year, he was on the short list for lieutenant, and six months after that, he was on an even shorter list for a command rank. Commander Doverly was right behind him with every step. Her early graduation from the academy at age 19 earned her a degree in aerospace medicine, which she parlayed into the space military equivalent of an MD 18 months later. She applied to flight school, set records in some of the entrance tests, and lost a bid to replace Jason Hunter as a student squadron leader by half a decimal point. When he turned around and recruited her for his squadron, instead of letting her lead a different team, it sent shockwaves through the entire class. Doverly accepted and became the number two pilot in what would eventually come to be known as the greatest combat squadron in Skywatch history. Of all his fellow officers, Jason knew it would be Anora who would refuse to accept the pat answer. He had observed her relentless nature on so many occasions it was hard to keep them all straight. He was there when she helped a first-time mom overcome 19 hours of labor to deliver twins. He was there when the young Lieutenant Doverly discovered a flaw in the upgraded fuel system of the first-generation Yellow Jacket fighters at the Academy Air and Space Show. She earned a commendation from a Vice Admiral for that particular act, since it saved the lives of eight of her fellow pilots. Everyone told her she was wrong. The technicians and engineers tried to tell her to mind her own business, and that doctors didn't belong on the flight line in the first place but she didn't give up, and Hunter was there to see every moment of it. The night before, she arrived at the receiving line for the officer's ball looking like a monarch's daughter. 
She wore a glittering off-the-shoulder gown and wore her auburn hair in delicate curls down her back. Her grandmother's silver necklace completed a stunning ensemble. She was the talk of the night, and Jason had the honor of dancing with her not once, but twice. The next morning she was nose-to-nose -nose with a chief petty officer, Atmos in one hand and a wrench in the other. Jason was almost certain he had found the perfect woman on that day, but he was more than certain he had found his combat wing. She was going to be told what everyone thought had happened over Bayonne 3 and what had happened at Omicron. She was going to end up with the exact same information as his sister. They were all in pursuit of the same man. Competent officers were going to explain the chase to Honora in detail. They might even throw in a few pie charts and spreadsheets. And when it was all over, Jason Hunter knew his number two pilot was going to respond with the profane version of nonsense and set out in search for the real answers. When she found them, and found the trail of the missing civilian she was pursuing, the captain was going to have all the pieces in place to execute his strategy. He was going to strike at his enemy where they least expected. The entire Perseus officer's corps knew whatever disappeared through the mysterious doorway at Raleo had to be connected to the buildup of hostilities between the Sarn and the Alliance. If there was one thing they had all learned, it was the fact the correlation between Colonel Atwell's misguided discoveries and the decision by no fewer than four alien governments to become belligerent enough to start a war were connected. Finding the connection would undoubtedly be the key to stopping the threat and winning the war. If Hunter had to follow his unidentified enemy through that doorway into the unknown, so be it. It wouldn't be the first time the captain had risked life and limb to protect mankind's planets. His confidence in his wing pilot was his anchor. As it turned out, he only needed a pair of jacks to survive Atlantis. That's why he knew a pair of jacks would be enough to beat Shea Bane's abductors and whatever Okshada and Mu had run into on M. Seti 8. The rest were bills that had to be paid in the future. At the moment, however, someone nearby was cooking a magical combination of green peppers, eggs, and bacon. It was like time shattered. The conference room aboard the starship Psy Key was not quite as luxurious as the three line officers remembered from their time aboard much larger vessels. But it was also sparse and lacked distractions, which was a key advantage for this particular meeting. Jace had been granted leave by Admiral Tucker to pursue a priority target. Before mustering her forces and settling the Raleo situation once and for all, the commander decided to get the inside story directly from the source. Vice Admiral Charles Hughes had recovered to the point where he at least looked like he was part of Skywatch again. He wore the closest approximation of an admiral's uniform the Master Chief could find in the ship's stores. It helped that none of the other officers or crew present aboard the frigate were officially assigned to her. In the short time they had manned her as their more easily managed forward deployed ship, Commander Jace Hunter and the other members of her ad hoc recon unit had made themselves at least temporarily at home. Yili Curtis had engineering in top shape. Zoni Tixia had overhauled the tiny ship's communications equipment, giving her the equivalent of a destroyer's electronic warfare capability, and Hunter herself had helped reorient the weapon systems into something a little more efficient. Psy Key was no longer underpowered, which was good news because captain and crew were on a mission. Jace Hunter personally believed most of the dangers faced by Strike Fleet Perseus and its various attached units were the result of incomplete information regarding their adversary. So she made a series of briefings with Admiral Hughes, the top priority for herself and the other senior officers, before another moment was invested in tracking down whatever was going on in the Raleo star system. They needed answers, and they needed them soon. There was no way either Hunter was going to tolerate reality-bending question marks while they were trying to keep humanity itself alive. What exactly does that mean, Admiral? Hughes took a breath to speak. Hunter realized she needed to keep things focused and shifted gears. Scratch that. Let's go back to the beginning. Dunkirk is ordered to Gatern. Why? The Admiral sighed. He looked weary but the other officers and Master Chief Buckmaster knew he wasn't as frail as he had been. Skywatch Command briefed myself and Captain Leary before we departed. Our initial course took us to each of the key waypoints along the reach. The plan was to make Dunkirk visible to any potential aggressors. So you weren't trying to avoid detection? Hughes nodded. That is correct. Buckmaster leaned back in his chair and tugged at his beard. Hunter persisted. Admiral, why just the Dunkirk? 
If the purpose was to show the flag as Jason believes, how would a single strike cruiser deter an aggressor? You have good instincts, Commander, Hughes said with a chuckle. I asked the same question before we departed and didn't get much of a coherent response. There were a lot of words, but none of the admirals giving the orders were present when the right questions were asked. Those who were there didn't have much to say. It was all very confusing. The kind of confusing you get when people are trying to cover their tracks, Zoni Tixia said abruptly. Jason said they were after us. Maybe they were after the Admiral too. It would give them the perfect excuse to order Argent into the region to investigate. Once we get here, we became a target just like Dunkirk. Hughes nodded at Zoni's reasoning. Jay still had her arms folded. I have to admit, Admiral, she has a point. Argent was a target for at least two major attacks, and so were we. Perseus was attacked? Correct. They came after us when we were in formation at Station 19. Ships started appearing out of nowhere during a long-range energy weapons attack. Fury was hit hard. We almost lost the Constellation. I think whatever they were trying to accomplish at the station got disrupted by us. They took a swipe at Exeter and were driven back. Then they took out after our whole task force. When that didn't work, they sent an even heavier force after my brother. All to protect Barker's asteroid and one sentinel, Yili added. Hughes got up and stood at the display. Psyche's conference had a smaller screen than Argent or Fury, but it was perfectly capable of displaying the Gitern region, complete with the asteroid field, the positions of Uniform and X-Ray Tango, and Scorpion 1-3. Flypaper, Hughes said quietly. I beg your pardon, sir, Buckmaster said. If I wanted to keep a task force occupied for an indeterminate number of days, how would I go about it? The Admiral asked rhetorically. Keep throwing targets at them, Hunter replied. What does this map look like to you, Commander? Atwell had the ability to teleport matter from one place to the next. He phase-shifted Argent's whole crew into some kind of matter warp, Zoni said. We used his devices to get to the asteroid in the first place. And that, Miss Tixia, is what I mean when I say it was like time shattered. Hughes made his way back to his seat. He had a bit of extra energy, which Jace interpreted as his zeroing in on a plausible theory. Bart James is a powerful man. He also has an incisive mind when it comes to evaluating threats. That's why I couldn't understand his vociferous objections to the buildup. He saw the intelligence. We had the LRS passes over Rho Theta and the telemetry from Repeater 5. We had all the history from Prairie Grove. Our enemies lost a manufacturing empire when we forced them to capitulate at Cloudmark. We knew that would anger all the wrong governments. We persisted and some still believe we have the advantage. Cloudmark was the ceasefire that ended First Praetorian, wasn't it? Yili asked. Buckmaster nodded. One of the most one-sided ends to hostilities in living memory, kind of like a bankrupt business. Three people enter with their wallets, two wallets leave with their owners, and the third guy gets thrown overboard. The third guy in this case being the Sarn Star Empire, Hunter said. Hughes nodded. We won. That didn't mean we had to choke them after the beating. The same officers that are now so confident in our advantage were the ones that helped engineer it. They didn't listen to reason then, and they aren't listening now. They became what most of Skywatch calls the anti-alarmists. They managed to drive career line officers out of the fleet by the dozens. They broke up trained crews. They lobbied to cut funding from long-standing defense initiatives so the money and the power that went with it could be diverted elsewhere. Let's take this to its logical conclusion, Admiral, Hunter said. The anti-alarmists send you and a single strike cruiser to Gitarn for the purposes of deterring our enemies from any aggressive action along the reach. Your ship is waylaid. My brother is sent after you. They try to take Argent out, so he calls in reinforcements and then they try to take me and my task force out. That was the sequence of events if I recall them correctly, Hughes replied. Doesn't that strengthen the case for the alarmists? Hunter asked. A ship sent to protect Gitarn gets attacked? But the Admiral is one of the alarmists. Buckmaster replied. It helps the anti-alarmists if he's not available to champion their cause. This kind of stuff makes me dizzy, Zoni said. If Dunkirk never comes home, they can make up any story they want, Yili added. The Admiral went crazy and fired on friendly ships. Dunkirk collided with an asteroid, Captain Hunter. Buckmaster sat up. Jay snapped her fingers. That's it. She scrambled out of her chair and moved quickly to the map. It all came down to Scorpion 1-3. She slid the controls horizontally and advanced the chronometer in the display until Kingsblade and Argent were on station and engaged with the second Sentinel planetary defense battery. 
Silverback 755 was detected out of position by Kingsblade. It was a setup. Whoever engineered this engagement expected that ship to become the target. They may as well have had an LED on her hull flashing, shoot me. They probably planned for Kingsblade to open up first, Yili said. And she did. But Honora was in command and she fired to disable, not destroy. Then Dunkirk is destroyed by one or the other sentinel, Hunter continued. And the anti-alarmists get everything they want. Hughes is out of the way. And Captain Hunter is broken. They could even charge him with manslaughter, Buckmaster concluded. The rising star becomes a fallen man. A perfect anti-poster boy to justify remaking the fleet in their own image. By surrendering the whole Gitarn reach? What does that accomplish? Zoni asked. It keeps Skywatch away from Raleo, Hunter replied. Where one Colonel Zachariah Atwell was hard at work trying to turn his dangerous discovery into his very own interstellar empire. So the story about the chase that ended up there wasn't just a rumor? Zoni asked. Constellation got it all on tape, Yili said. Telemetry, lookdowns, sensor readings, you name it. Commander Flynn got it all. Putting high-energy probes on missiles and firing them at the planet? Genius. The man is a certifiable genius. What happened, Captain? Hughes asked. What you encountered was best described as a psychic echo, Hunter replied. The what now? Yili asked. Mental energy stored inside physical objects, Jace continued. You might even say living souls. That's what invaded your mind. Tried to do the same to my brother. Started shifting objects and people from one dimension to another. Made people think they were hearing and seeing one thing when in reality they were experiencing something else entirely. Who did Constellation chase to Raleo too? Buckmaster asked. We don't know, Hunter replied. It wasn't Atwell, but whoever it was, he had the artifact with him when Flynn lost contact. What artifact? Zoni asked. Whatever allowed him to control the obelisk construct on the planet. Constellation got the only known shots of the thing before she was ordered back to base. Powers buried it all in a vault. Chances are we'll never know. But we do know someone made it to the planet. Someone who isn't Colonel Atwell. And then he wasn't on the planet, Buckmaster said. Correct. He took the artifact through some kind of doorway under the obelisk. Not entirely sure what his objective was, but Constellation found some clues. Flynn told a story about malfunctioning engines to give his surface analysis teams time to gather readings, Hunter replied. He's under orders not to talk about it, but he did tell me a highly entertaining story about hypothetical readings that indicated another time disruption. He traveled through time. Great, Yili said. Well, at least we have all kinds of highly experimental technology to match him now. Whoever this guy is, he has to be in it with Atwell. Just like the anti-alarmists, Buckmaster said with a tone of finality in his voice. I suppose it makes sense. The man was a certifiable dingbat. He'll fit right in with a bunch of admirals who think wiping out two generations of line officers is the way forward. Present company accepted, of course, sir. Hughes nodded. I agree, Master Chief. For all I know, they sent my ship out here as a practice target for their interdimensional weapons. They could have used their mind control against Captain Hunter or anyone in the Perseus task force for that matter. One can only wonder why they didn't. It would have given them all the justification they needed if breaking the captain was their plan. Battle plans have a habit of going to hell, sir, Hunter said. Especially when your opponent does the unexpected. Well, we'd better start coming up with some more dodges and weaves, Buckmaster said. Because if our latest intelligence is accurate, the Sarn's next target is one we absolutely can't afford to lose. Rebecca agrees. I didn't invite her to this meeting. I probably should have reconsidered that decision. But here we are. Commander Islington believes Core 7 is the target of the next attack, Hunter announced. It's far-fetched. But based on what we now know about the motives of the anti-alarmists, it makes a twisted kind of sense, Yili added. If you're going to remake Skywatch in your own image, what better way to do so than to point at its failure to protect an Alliance planet? Or... Let's suppose for a moment you don't want to remake Skywatch. Let's suppose you just want to hand the keys to some superior alien race and turn the core alliance into an insect colony, Hunter replied. If our territory is invaded and civil war breaks out, whomever wants to take over can offer the Ithis and their technology as the means of restoring order. If that's their plan, then we've got a big problem, Buckmaster said. 
We don't have anywhere near the forces necessary to fight our way past the anti-alarmists and get to Core 7 in time to protect the population. Even if they are working against us, they have rank and a hell of a lot of firepower. And they might have Shay, which compromises our entire government, Zoni added. We're going to have to improvise, Master Chief, Hunter said. They've got a huge head start. If this was their plan all along, they could get to Core 7 and occupy it with one of those teleportation devices, or their mind control like the Admiral says. They could really assault and control a core planet, Zoni said in a faraway voice. Jace Hunter's eyes burned. Not on my watch, 